blessing, grace, and favor be unto you all. The First Lady of the Churches of God in Christ everywhere, Evangelist Karen Clark Sheard and Mary Mary sharing with us, we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel still works. We want to talk about that this evening. So I want to just take a few moments and let the song minister to you. And welcome in all of you to God be the glory for his goodness and grace. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me and joining us. Sister Patricia, God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord. Praying for your dad and mom. For the strength and guidance of Almighty God. I uh, hope that everyone will hit the share button. I believe and the like button and let me know you're here just hit the like you know and share this and i believe that it's going to bless you in a great way the evangelist shared and the mary mary reminds us if you believe it and receive it the gospel will save heal and transform you it'll give you everlasting life thank you lord god bless you I speak, I say that not just out of repetition or redundancy, but God bless you. It is my prayer for you. Come on in, everybody, and let's get in, get into this word of the Lord. God bless you. It's Jasmine Evans. Good evening. Blessings and favor be with you. Yes, the word of the Lord, the gospel. Hallelujah the gospel yes lord yes lord we want to talk about that tonight let's not forget it is the gospel of jesus christ that saves heals and delivers it is the as they said it sets the captives free uh it has power to deal with any situation in your life so lord on this evening as we delve into your word thank you for your goodness and for your grace we thank you for your mercy your kindness and favor we pray that you'll be with us dear god as we share in your holy scriptures thank you for life health and strength what a joy what a blessing oh god in these trying times in which we are living thank you for sparing our lives and keeping us safe and blessed and protected and favored god we covenant with you that we're going to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bless our time together in Jesus' mighty name. We are not ashamed. Come on. Hallelujah. Yes. 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 How many believe that? It is. It gives us everlasting life. Yes, Lord. God bless. Amen. Come on. We're not ashamed of the gospel. I want you to hit that like and share button, please. Saints, I believe that the Lord's going to bless us tonight in his holy word. Come on. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, yes. Of the gospel. Hallelujah. Amen. For it is. This is what we have. Everlasting life. All right, we're going to have to let this go. But remember, the gospel is what saves you and gives you eternal life. So that you don't have to die and go to hell. So thank God for that wonderful gift of the holy of the of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may it continue to favor your life. May you continue to walk in the greatness goodness kindness and blessings of the lord again it's good to be with you on this evening i hope and pray that those of you who were at church sunday and those of you who watch us online that you will remember that there is a battle before the breakthrough i hope that word blessed you i hope that it encouraged you and helped to give you strength to make it through whatever battles you may have to go through if you're going through it because you're on the verge of something great and there's a breakthrough for you and so just believe the lord for that i want you to turn your bibles to the book of colossians 
it is. Uh, the book of Colossians is a very fascinating book. The Apostle Paul, we believe, is the writer of the book of Colossians. Uh, he writes to these Jewish and Gentile converts. It was a challenging time that Paul was writing in. That's why I want to share out of this book today, entitled this evening's discourse, this evening's teaching, The Gospel Still Works. Um, these are challenging times that Paul finds himself, uh, that the Church of Colossae, Colossae finds themselves in. Um, there was this syncretism of Greek philosophy and Jewish legalism and mysticism. And these, they, they were synchronizing all of these beliefs and religious systems and philosophies. And um, then it was also encountering the era of Gnosticism. You know, the Gnostics back then declared that anything that was tangible, physical, if you could touch it, like humanity, then it was evil. And so by their assertion, Jesus could not have been God in the flesh because anything tangible flesh is evil. And it was being, it was really, really gaining traction and in the first century. And Paul has to argue against it, against this false teaching that was threatening the church, uh, this religious pluralism, as it were. And you know what? You know, it was polytheism to the greatest degree. I mean, even more than that, it, it, it was just people were believing what they wanted to believe. The Jews had their beliefs, the mystics had their beliefs, the Greeks had their beliefs. Blending it all together, and I'm, I selected this because, quite frankly, it reminds us of the days in which we're living in right now, if you, if you will. They, they were just embracing a little bit of everything, and we live in a day now, saints of God, when it seems like any, every, and all things are being embraced. It seems like people are doing whatever they feel led to do. They believe whatever they feel so inclined to believe. You hear this word, really, really, this, this term really bounced around a lot, this word inclusion. You hear it almost everywhere. And the notion is it's the times that we're living in where everything is to be embraced. Inclusion embraces, accepts, uh, holds uh, every and anything. And so, you know, it's, it's a syncretism of whatever. You know, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, what, whatever. No, no, no religious beliefs. Just, you know, your own philosophy. Whatever your philosophy is, whatever. You know, if you believe there's no God, then these days and times, it's it's to be embraced. It's to be respected. It's to be understood. I mean, just if you believe that there's no eternity, that's your prerogative. Nobody bothers you. If you believe that you, you know, you're not a him or a her, you're not a male or a female, nobody bothers you in these days and times. Syncretism, this polytheistic time that we're living in, living in this pluralistic approach to, I, I'll say the word religion, even though Christianity to me is not a religion, because you can be religious to anything. You can be religious to alcohol. Anything you're devoted and dedicated to could be your religion, as it were. Christianity, if not necessarily a, a religion as much as it is an intelligent living out of a lifestyle. I want you to get that. It's the intelligent living out of a lifestyle. Christianity is a belief in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If you don't believe in what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, then you're not, you're not Christian. Here too, you must follow the directives of Jesus Christ and the word of the Lord. So Paul, among other things, wants to establish, here it is, the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And in today's times that we're living in, where I'm telling you absolutely nothing is off limits. I mean, we, mass murders are a dime a dozen, as it were. It's so tragic until we're becoming numb to it. Uh, the man there and that young kid there in Buffalo who just, you know, had a hatred for black people and you know, just wanted to, didn't want to see the black race supersede the white race. Now, how do you figure killing 10 or 12 people? I mean, there's a whole lot more of us than that, but that's his warped thinking. 
And, and you know, that's what sin does. It warps your mind. It disturbs your mentality. Sin disrupts your life. Sin renders you null and void. Sin will snatch everything that is significant and important from you. And so we're living in these times where people are doing whatever they feel so inclined to do. And it is not the time for the Christian church to be quiet, to be lackadaisical. It is the time to have our conviction. It is the time to for sure be a man and a woman of conviction. Everybody say conviction. We have to have conviction. So this whole book of Colossians really wants to really engender the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Paul reminds them it's not the Gnosticism that saved you. It's, it's not Greek philosophy that saved you. It's not mysticism that saved you. It's not even Judaism that saved you. It was Jesus the Christ who saved you. And he, God wants us to remind ourselves of that. I'm going to be reading out of the first chapter. And I'm just going to read a few verses, verses 21 through 23. I'll read a couple before so that we can give a little context to it. Um, but we got. Let me, let me just read that for you and let you, let you know that this is a great opportunity for the church. So Colossians chapter 1, but reminding you that this is our moment. I've been saying it a lot, but I hope and pray that you'll embrace it. It seems just the, uh, just the contrary. That you, when you say it's our moment, it seems like the church is having its greatest challenges, difficulties, and struggles. But it's our moment if we would allow it to be. Are you all with me here? If we would allow it to be, it is indeed our moment. Um, and so, you know, uh, Christianity is about service service. You're not a real believer if you're not serving someone or something. Sir, Jesus, Mark 10, 45, one of the most pivotal passages in scripture. I have, it's so significant. It's one of the passages, many, but one of the ones that I've memorized. He said, even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is setting a precedence there that Christianity is about service. Service, when are we going to get that? And nothing of what Jesus did was convenient. None of it was comfortable. None of it was easy. It didn't come without, without um, you know, being talked about. It didn't come without controversy, the word I'm looking for. It didn't come without friction, but he kept serving and that's what we're called to do and 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 to remember how jesus saved each of us you know he's the old man i remember how he saved me and what he did in my life now i mean for real i was i was confused i was suicidal as an 18 year old and you know just i was just mixed up not knowing what was up and down not knowing what left and right was again i was very suicidal i was just in a messed up state of mind and state of being but within that context i went to church one sunday i had partied that night before and but i something it just and compelled me to get up and go to church you know i partied all summer in 1976 but I, I went to church every sunday i wasn't being hypocrite you know i i was seeking the lord but i didn't have a mind to be saved so i said i'm gonna go to church and god i'm just gonna ask you to give me a mind some people think if you're not saved and you went to the club or something you can't you shouldn't come to church you're the one who should come to church coming to church doesn't make you a hypocrite you're only a hypocrite if you accept christ and don't live the christian life but if you're not saved if you're struggling if you're doing whatever you need to find yourself in church so that you can hear the gospel the good news of jesus christ and so I did my thing, you know, but that next day I would come to church. Again, I wasn't claiming to be a Christian. I wasn't claiming to be saved. But, but, you know, I knew that I needed to be saved. And I knew coming to church, hearing the gospel was a good start, a good way to get that process going. And sure enough, one day, uh, the preacher who was my uncle was preaching the word of the Lord. And it reached my soul. It reached my spirit and saved my life. And I've never been the same. I'm talking about a second corinthians 5 17 transformation that if you're in christ you're a new creation i mean when jesus saved me he made me over i got saved for real i changed 
I transformed. I no longer wanted to do the things I used to do. I no longer wanted to be involved with sin. For me. It doesn't make sense to get saved and still want to be like the world. Why would I come out from the world to want to be, go back to be like the world? I didn't want to have anything, anything else to do with that. And so that's the message that I boast to sinners and tell them, man, I was a mess. I was, I was whacked. I was suicidal. I was deranged in many ways. I was depressed. I was dejected. But within that context, the gospel, the good news, I heard the message of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And it's transformed my very life. And I have not been the same ever since. And that's been over 42 years ago. And I've not been the same since. And so praise God. And that, it, it, I'm like that song, I'm, um, I'm, I'm saved and I know I am. I'm saved by his power divine. And so I thank God for that. So you go tell people how he saved you. Tell people how he delivered you. Tell them how he set you free. That's what the gospel is about, telling people what Jesus did for you. What's so difficult about that, and why are we so secretive on that? <laughs> if he's been good to us, you know, if he set you free, if he delivered you, then you should want others to get that same deliverance. Can somebody say amen? You should want others to have that same salvation if you know that he saved your life. What are you waiting for? Oh, my Lord, to get somebody else saved. Tanya Green, what are we waiting for? Good to see you, cousin. And God bless me, Ellen, Kevin McAfee. And, and always good to see Sister, Sister Bridget Singleton all the way from Texas. Uh, yeah, she's. I, that's it, man. I do on a regular. That's right. We've got to tell people. That's all we can do is tell them. We can't make them accept it, but we can sure tell them. I was in the bank just uh, the other day, ye yesterday, you know, and um, begging them to give me some, <laughs> when I was in the bank, and the young lady, you know, um, uh, and, and and we started talking, and then we got into, you know, I'm always going to get try to get somebody to the Lord, and, and thank God uh, this Sunday, she and her mother are coming to church. Uh, that's what it's all about, friend. That's what we're called to do. Look at First Co Co at um, Colossians. Not a long word tonight, but the everybody say the gospel still works. You need to say that to yourself. Uh, I'm gonna re I'm gonna uh, talk from verses 21 through 23 of chapter one, but let me start with verse 19 from the New King James. I love the New Living Translation as well. It says for it pleased the Father that in Him, who in Jesus, the fullness should dwell. Jesus was all God, and Paul wants to remind us of that. Verse 20 says, and by him to reconcile, the word reconcile means to bring back, to reconcile all things to himself. Buddha couldn't do it. Zoroaster couldn't do that. Muhammad couldn't do it. Confucius couldn't do it. Only Jesus could reconcile humanity back to himself. How blessed we are as Christians to to serve the one who literally changed our lives and not serving a false religion, a false belief. He reconciled by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of through, through the blood of his cross. It is it is it is the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no taking away of sin. Jesus, my brothers and my sisters, had to die. Not only that, but he had to shed his blood, his blood, he shed his blood that you and I would have a right to the tree of life. Let me read the text for this evening and talk a few minutes on it and let you continue enjoying your evening. But I hope that this is blessing you. The gospel still works. I wanted to just challenge us this evening to really, 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 really get, get into really talking about the master. Look at verse 20. And you... All of us, and because of in light of what he just shared, and you who once were alienated, when you're alienated from something, you're you're, you're separated from it, and 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 watch this, not only alienated but enemies in your mind by wicked works. See, that's where the devil wants to do his work in the mind. Yet now he has reconciled. Here we were, we were alienated. We were enemies in our mind by wicked works. The devil had us thinking stupid, crazy stuff, 
consequence and they had us doing stupid and crazy stuff. But he said, now you have been reconciled. Verse 22, and in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So do all, you know, you were a mess, but he, you were alienated, you were enemies and, and um, in your mind toward God, in your mind toward yourself, you did wicked works because of it, but God reconciled you and in the body of Christ, it was done of his flesh through death. He died so that you wouldn't be alienated from God anymore, my good friends. What a word. He died so that you wouldn't be separated from God. He died so that your mind would not be enemies with God and enemies with yourself. He died so that you don't have to be mentally ill. He died that you don't have to have sickness in your mind. He died that the enemy would not captivate and capture your mind. He died so that we would be holy and blameless and above approach in his sight. That's the power of Christianity. That's not perfection as I was sharing Sunday. But when you really get Jesus, you become holy and blameless before him. And the final version then we'll kind of come back and talk through them. If indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast. Watch that. This all happened. But look at verse 23. Underline that if indeed you continue in the faith. So it's not just automatic. Some people think once you're saved, you're always saved. No, you can lose your salvation by turning away from Jesus Christ and, and, and deciding to not believe in who he is and was. When you backslide, you're saying, I'm turning away. I don't, want, I don't believe this anymore. Then how can you still be saved? Paul said, if indeed you continue in the faith, you got to continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and and are not moved away from the hope. Stay with me, good friends. Not moved away from the hope. Don't move from the hope of the gospel. Everybody say the gospel. The hope for the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which he heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven. Yes, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So Paul is really spewing out some serious theology right there. He's reminding us that the supremacy is not in Gnosticism. The supremacy is not in Judaism. The supremacy is not in mysticism. The supremacy is not in Greek philosophy. The supremacy is not, not in post-modernity that we live in. The supremacy is not in you thinking you can be another gender other than what God made you. The supremacy is not in the politics of our land. The supremacy is not in all the belief systems in our land. The supremacy is not in a man or a woman. The supremacy is not in the economy. The supremacy is in Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness. I hope that you all are with me here. It's in Jesus Christ. And that's why we've got to share this good news with other people. Yes, these are trying times that we're living in. Yes, they are indeed. I was looking um, at the newspaper, I'm sorry, at the uh, at the news and continuing to see this fiasco, this disaster that's happening there in Ukraine, you know, and the Russians are just absolutely stubborn and just just all the atrocities that are happening there, all the atrocities with all of the all of the shootings that are happening in our land. And we all when we leave our houses we're praying that the Holy Spirit would watch over us, protect us, and keep us. That's all the that's all we have. It's dangerous. We are not safe anywhere except the Lord keep us. The Bible says, "Lest the watchman watches, do lest the Lord watch keeps over us. We, we we watch in vain." And so, yes, these are strange times we're living in. You know, and it's a time where Gen X and Gen 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 Y and even Gen Z is really questioning the Christian faith to a great extent. It's just a time when people are believing whatever they want to believe. Church attendance is at an all-time low, and the pandemic has, has, has uh, people have used the pandemic as an excuse for why they don't, they're not coming to church. And, uh, you know, and some say that some people, 23% of Christians will not come back to the local physical church. I'm like, I don't know what Bible they're reading. I'm not, I don't even have that argument much anymore because all I know is if you read this Bible, you're not gonna you're not gonna you're not gonna succumb to that kind of argument. You're not gonna believe 
that you can't come back to church. As a matter of fact, you're like, well, God knows I'm getting church at home. I'm getting church, you know, uh, on the internet. Well, I'm watching the, 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 the Facebook Live. I'm watching the YouTube. I'm getting the word no. But that's not biblical. The Bible said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. But Bishop, we're in a pandemic. Well, why don't you think about that when you go everywhere else you go? <laughs> Come on, somebody. You don't even think about it. it the, the church is the only place where we feel like we have to stay away from because it's a pandemic that we're in. We're going everywhere else we want to go. So those are excuses. But Jesus has been too good to you. That baffles my mind. And so what I'm after are the people who are not saved, who will come to church and we can introduce them to Jesus Christ. That's who I'm going after. I'm going after those who don't know Jesus, that we can disciple them. I bet you they'll come to church and embrace the things of God. That's who I'm going after. These are trying times. Our generation of youth, enemies trying to wipe them out. But it's also our time to shine. Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. It is the gospel who saved, that saves, heals. And we're called to serve our society with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is anybody getting that? I'm going to say it again. We are called to serve our society with the gospel of Jesus Christ, my friend. It still works. Talk to people about Jesus. Let's look at verse 21 again. He says, that, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind. So we were alienated from God. That literally is translated um it's, it's, it's translated to an, uh, to another owner. In other words, somebody else owned you. His name was the devil. It speaks of estrangement from God. We were estranged from God by sin and adultery. And Paul wants the church at Colossae to understand you were alienated. You were enemies. You were hostile against God. And he, an enemy affected your mind, your thoughts, your disposition. That's what your mind is, your thoughts, your disposition, your attitude. He affected all that because of sin. You were enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now you have been reconciled. So he wants us to know that, you know, your mind was was affected and it expressed outwardly in evil behaviors because when it's in your mind, you, you manifest it in your life. Paul is reminding the, the church at Colossians, the Colossians, um, of the blessings of the reconciliation that that God did for them through Jesus Christ by recalling their conditions before salvation. Paul is like, now remember before you were saved, this is who you were. And he's telling each of us today, remember before you were saved, how messed up you were, for what you how 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 out of out of touch you were, how out of joint disjointed you were. Paul is saying, remember all of that. Remember that. Before you get lax in your faith and before you decide I'm not, you know, you're not opening your mouth to talk about Jesus, Paul wants to remind us of who we were before salvation. Reconciliation brings you back, here it is, into the presence of God. Can you imagine that? The very presence of Elohim, the very presence of Jehovah, the very presence of the God of the universe, the holy and powerful and anointed and a dynamic God salvation through the blood of Jesus brings us back in God uh, made peace with you when he saved you through Jesus hallelujah and he led us into his presence so when I get on my knees and get before the Lord I realize I'm in the presence of almighty God oh my goodness and when I'm saved the Bible said Christ in me the hope as I'm saved, Christ in me the hope of glory Huh? And, and John, John um, Peter said the divine nature of God lives in us. So that's why everywhere I go, whatever I do, I remember God lives in me. So I need to be careful what I do, where I go, and all of the, all of the above, what I think and everything, because God lives in me. And look at verse 22. In the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and blameless. In other words, he's saying... You know, you were you were a mess, you were enemy, your mind was whacked, but God reconciled you in the body of his flesh. In other words, Jesus had to pay that ignominious price on the cross of Calvary and die to present you and make you holy and blameless. He had to die. He had to let his flesh go through all of that to present you holy and blameless. He had blameless. He had to go on the cross and bleed. 
He had to suffocate. He had to be mistreated. He had to be spit upon. He had to be stoned. He had to have a crown of thorns on his head. He had to have a spear in his side. All of these things were so that you could be holy and blameless and above reproach in God's sight. My goodness, man, I'm getting excited just thinking about what Jesus did for me. That's why I keep it fresh in my mind so that I don't have the inclination to just be lackadaisical in my faith. He's done so much for me. As the songwriter said, I cannot tell it all. Jesus died to present you holy. Do you know how amazing that is? Because God is holy. And Peter says, since God is holy, you be holy. The word holy, it means to be consecrated and dedicated. It means to be set apart. That's why I keep telling folks, if the, you know, you read the Bible, saints. You're, you're called to be holy. Jesus made you holy when he saved you. And that means you're set apart. That means you're pure, you're undefiled, not perfection. But you can't contaminate holiness with worldliness. Come on, somebody. Somebody ought to write that down and, and, and send it out. Hashtag Bishop Reggie with us. You can't contaminate holiness with worldliness. You can't do it because by its very nature, holiness is not worldliness by its very definition. It's separation from the world, from the things of the devil, from sin. And we are called, not just the preacher, we are holy through the blood of Jesus Christ. And not just that, but blameless, not perfection, because we can't be that. We learned that Sunday. But our position is in Christ. Now, here, as I sit before you and share the word of the Lord, I am, you are, we are positioned in Christ. I'm positioned on this chair, in this chair. And as you can see that in the spirit realm, we're positioned in Christ. We're free from accusations. And, and so because you're positioned in Christ, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Yes? Come on, somebody. So accept who you are in Jesus Christ. Amen. Accept that you're positioned in him, that you're positioned in a place of authority and power. You're set free. And so don't, don't, what I say, if don't let people condemn you, don't let them do it because they didn't save you. Hello, somebody. The text lets us know that we have been changed because of what Jesus did on the cross. He and he alone is supreme. He and he alone has the power and the authority to do it. And so with the next few moments we have left, here's a few things I want you to understand. Remember our subject, the gospel still works. So to that end, the first thing I want you to remember, don't ever stop believing God. That's the first thing I want you to remember. Don't ever stop believing in and believing God. Stay rooted and stay firm in your faith. I don't care how bad it gets. Your battle is just right before your breakthrough. Come on, somebody. I don't care how tough things get. Your reliance has to be on Jesus, not your situation. I've been reminding myself of that lately because I've been going through some things, and I'm reminding myself, look, your faith can't waver because you're going through your battles. You're going through your challenges. You're going through all the things the enemy wants to do to frustrate you and take you off balance and every all the things that he wants to do. Your, your faith cannot waver because of it. Your faith cannot waver. Hold to your faith because of what Jesus did for you. You can hold to your faith because he died on the cross for your sins. You can hold to your faith because he reconciled you. Don't stop believing and trusting him. Don't stop believing God. Things may not be be all that you want them to be. You know what the, the saints used to say? He may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. Somebody say amen to that. He's always on time. So don't give up your hope. The gospel, everybody say it still works. Don't give up your hope. The gospel still works. That's what I want you to remember is keep believing God. Keep trusting God in the midst of the greatest trial you may be in, in the midst of the greatest tribulation. You may be in the biggest challenge of your life. The good news of the gospel is not just that it saved us from sin and saved us from hell and gave us eternal life, but it also gives us the ability to believe in the supremacy of Almighty God, the power of God, that God is going to work on your behalf if you just keep believing. So don't stop believing God. Don't stop believing 
believing in Jesus Christ. Don't stop believing in your healing. Don't stop believing in your deliverance. Don't stop believing in your victory. Don't stop believing in those prayers that you're, you're asking God to grant. Don't stop believing. The gospel has power to help you to believe. But then number two, remember that the gospel is a message of hope. H-O-P-E. That's what people need today. Hope. Come on, somebody. It is a message of hope. And we need to offer people hope, a reason to expect that something is going to get better. Don't be moved from your hope um, and from the hope of the gospel. Don't, don't know. I don't, you know, we're living in a time of ebbs and flows. And yes, things are challenging. And my goodness, sometimes we even ask ourselves, God, where are you? Or you even ask God that in your spirit because things are so amazingly awry and out of and disjointed. But don't stop. Don't be moved from your hope. The hope of the gospel, the hope of the good news of Jesus Christ, the hope of the blessed message of Jesus Christ. The gospel is good news. It's a happy story. It, if it's not good news, it's not the gospel. You can tell people the good news is he'll set you free. The good news is he's a healer. The good news is he, he saved. The word saved means to rescue that he'll rescue you from sin and rescue your mind from disruption and disturbance. The good news is that he will change your life and make it better. Come on, somebody. Remember, the gospel is a message of hope. People need that hope. Hey, hey, you, you're going through. I got some good news for you. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that you can be delivered from the thing you're going through so that you can, he can go through it with you. He died on the cross to save you, to rescue you from sin. The gospel uh, message saved your life. So have that same hope with other people. If it saved your life, tell somebody else, it can save your life. You know, this gospel message can save your life. Man, who doesn't want to tell that good news? Who doesn't want to let people know that there is a bomb in Gilead that makes wounded people whole? Who doesn't want to tell people that whatever you're going through, I've got a word for you. Ah, Jesus the Christ can make the difference and set you free from it. And so remember that the gospel message saved your life and it can save others. But secondly, remember that the gospel is a universal message. It's not just for a few people. It's not just for one denomination. It's a universal message. Uh, John, John, John spoke and he said, John did it, said it like this, Behold the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is a universal Christ. Oh, yes, he for all seven and a half billion people on this planet. Some folk are serving something other than God, and it's Jesus whose gospel message we got to get in them. So remember the gospel is a universal message, but then three, understand that you're called to be a servant of that gospel. Yeah, come on, somebody. You're called to be a servant of that gospel. Somebody ought to say amen to me. Serve the gospel. How do you serve the gospel? By pronouncing it everywhere, by propagating it, by living up to the standards of Jesus Christ, by remembering in everything you do, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I've got the Holy Spirit in my life. I'm going to serve the gospel by being a good Christian. I'm going to serve the gospel by forgiving. I'm going to serve the gospel by, by, by ministering to people. I'm going to serve the gospel by encouraging people. I'm going to serve the gospel by never having anything negative to say about people. I'm going to serve the gospel by being positive. Positive. I'm going to serve the gospel by telling somebody about this good news. So Paul said, from the message of the cross, for some, Paul said this in, 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 in Corinthians, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Doesn't make sense to them, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. Oh my goodness. Listen, we don't need more. We, you know, we, we need social programs, but the answer is really not social program. The answer is more preaching. <laughs> Saints, I'm gonna make you a preacher. I don't talk about with a license. I'm not. I'm not gonna give you a license, and I'm not gonna stand you up behind the pulpit. But I'm gonna give you the authority to preach. I'm gonna give you the authority to open your mouth everywhere you go and tell people about Jesus. Tell people about the great Savior. Listen, that's what we need. Not necessarily more program. We need more preaching of the gospel. We've known great prophets in, in our history. I mean, we've known some great prophets in our history. We've known Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Great prophets in our history. But And the Jews knew 
um, you know, even had had great great kings that you know they never knew a greater king than than King David himself. And Solomon was infested with wisdom, and the Roman nation had great great men such as Pompey and Julius Caesar and uh, Augustus and Augustus Caesar. I mean, just great men. And the Greeks boasted of having their great philosophers, Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, and history has known great warriors such as Alexander the Great, and, and Joshua was a great warrior in the Bible, but there was never been anybody, I'm talking about anybody like Jesus, that's all I'm trying to tell you, we've seen all this greatness, but there's never been anybody like Jesus the Christ, are you all with me? His business was to preach, and that's why your business has to be to preach. Somebody help me now. His business was to preach, and you got to preach. Uh, you got to preach the word of the Lord. You got to preach it like you've never done it before. You got to tell people about Jesus. Uh, you know, we've got the complexities of nuclear war, and my God, that has the potential to wipe us off the planet. These are some challenging times that we're living in. When you talk, when you think of, of, of what could happen. And um, we have the complexities of nuclear war and, and warfare and just all kinds of things of that nature. But listen, Jesus, and with all of these complexities, he, he was a simple shepherd boy. No complexity. Just a simple shepherd boy. Born in a simple manger. And when he was 12 years old, he was confounding wise men. He was confounding physicians, asking them questions they could not answer. And they received him as a foolish man. And when he was, I'm just trying to tell you about who it is you need to be talking about. Who this man was great. He fed 5,000 people on one occasion with two fish and a few loaves of bread. I'm trying to tell you who you need to be talking about. He spat on the ground and made a man see again. Made, spit up, made clay from the spittle and made a man see um, come on, he, he he made the winds obey. I'm, are you all hearing what I'm saying? I'm talking about the great and awesome one. And you know, the streets were crowded with multitudes who followed him, shouting and, and giving him praise. His miracles were sermons by themselves. He touched lepers. He healed all manner of sickness and disease. And he lifted burdened souls. Is anybody hearing me tonight? He healed the bound and the brokenhearted. He fed the hungry multitudes. He delivered the captive souls. He he preached to the wise. Oh my God, he tore down um, and, and to the wise and tore down those who were torn down rather and burdened souls. He preached to them. He he, 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 he preached to those who were shut out and bound. He preached to the lonely. He preached to the poor. He preached to the rich. He preached to the up. He preached to the down. He preached to every ethnicity. He preached to those that felt insignificant and unworthy because of sin. And Jesus is telling us to preach that same message to those who don't feel worthy of it. Saints, I'm just trying to tell you, and I'm closing this thing. Go and tell, run, tell somebody that there is a Jesus, there's a Christ who can make the difference in the 21st century with all kinds of madness, all kinds of craziness, all kinds of belief systems. I mean, it seems like the message I'm talking about, it seems like it's, it's minimizing, but it should not. It should be maximizing because we should be preaching it unapologetically we should be preaching it consistently we should be preaching it with with every fiber of our being we should be preaching it with conviction we should be preaching it because hallelujah people need to hear it we should be preaching it because it is the difference maker we should be preaching it because it sets people free we should be preaching it because it heals people we should be preaching it because it delivers people we should be preaching it because it heals people's minds, we should be preaching it because it gives people peace in their mind. We should be preaching it because it'll heal your body. We should be preaching it because it'll transform your life. We should be preaching it because our children need to hear it. We should be preaching it because politicians need to hear it. Don't stop talking about Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God but through him. Don't let anybody fool you. My God, preach that message. Come on. 
open up your mouths and be bold for Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. And open up your mouths. I'm, I'm telling you, he said, if you do this, I'll be with you. I'll be with you and I'll do great things in your life. So my brothers and my sisters, it is time, Mount Calvary. It is time for everyone who may listen to this from wherever you may be. It is time to go back to really, 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 really talking about Jesus everywhere you go. Every loved one you know that's not saved, just tell them about Jesus on your job. As long as you don't get fired, tell them about Jesus. Tell your neighbor about Jesus. As I said, I was in the bank yesterday and was able to just maneuver through and being able to lift up the name of Jesus and invited the teller to church. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you to do what I'm not doing. I believe in the message. I believe in Jesus. I believe that he sets you free. I believe that he'll bless your life. I believe that he makes the difference. I believe that he gives us eternal life. I believe that he's transformative. I believe that he heals the sick. I believe that he can raise up the dead. I believe he can control your mind. I believe he can give you peace in your mind. I believe he can give you what it is you desire. Open your mouth and believe in Jesus Christ. There is a bomb in Gilead who makes the wounded whole, and his name is Jesus the Christ. Uh, I said his name is Jesus the Christ. All, everybody, whoever claimed Mr. Rell, God bless you. Good to see Sister Rakesha and all the saints. Everybody, whoever claimed Cousin Tanya to be to be God or dead. Every one of them is in the grave, but you go to you go to Confucius's grave, it's still there. You go to Zoriaster's grave, it's still there. You go to Muhammad's grave, it's still there. I can go down the line, Father Divine, Daddy Grave, their graves are still there. But you go to Jesus's grave and he's not there. He rolls on the third day. Oh my Lord, saints of God, now is the time. These are the last days. Jesus is coming soon. And as they said, run, tell that. Come on, somebody. Run, tell that. Run, tell somebody about the mighty sin. Do you believe he's real or, or, or did you forget about it? Or do you not really believe it? Why is it that you're not telling people? Why is it you're not opening your mouth? Why is it you're not being aggressive? Everybody else is being aggressive. The LGBTQ is as aggressive as they come. What what are you doing? What is what where's your conviction? What are you believing in? What are you aggressive about? Are you being aggressive with your kids? Well, the internet is being aggressive toward your kids. Those phone apps are being ag aggressive toward your kids. That stuff they're hearing in school is being aggressive toward your kids. You better be aggressive and tell them about mighty Savior Jesus Christ. Don't just bring them to church. Remind them that He ha. Ah, He's the one. He's the one who does it. He's the one who sets free. Ah, hallelujah. God bless you, Elder Kev. Lord bless all of you. Listen, I, I, I'm trying to teach it. I'm feeling a preach coming all over me. I got to stop. I got to stop. I got to stop because I feel like preaching. I feel like shouting, say, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I just feel that Jesus is the way, truth, and life. And, if we, and, and he, he can encourage you. And I'm encouraging myself as I'm encouraging you. I'm encouraging myself as I talk about Jesus. Good to see Elaine. It's so good to see you. We praise God for you. I'm encouraging myself that whatever I'm going through, ah, the bomb in Gilead can make me whole, can, can, can work it out, can do whatever needs to be done. <coughs> Excuse me. Whatever you're going through, the bomb in Gilead can get it done. Whatever you're going through, the bomb in Gilead can work on your behalf. Whatever you are going through, the bomb in Gilead is, Gilead is here to be, your heal, to be your healer. Tell people about Jesus. God bless you. I hope and pray that this word blessed you. Look forward so um, much to seeing you on Sunday. I want to encourage those who may be watching who still have not graced the physical church. Then I know that Mount Cap, we have some parking challenges, and I'm asking that you be patient and that you work hard to, you know, to don't, don't let the parking keep you from coming. As much as we can carpool and do those kind of things, that would be awesome. But I'm asking you to come on. Let's really let's let's come back to the physical church, and let's continue believing, saints. This week we need a breakthrough relative to property and what God is doing. 
where he's taking us. We need a breakthrough this week. There's power in prayer. This Jesus can do anything but fail. Would you keep Mount Calvary in your prayers? Would you would you put a mandate on the word of God? Would you put a demand on the word of God that God said he'll supply all of our need? We need a location. Give God and let him believe that it's going, you believe it's going to happen. Would you do that? Pray for your pastor and bishop. Uh, undergird us in prayer. This is not the easiest work on planet earth. It's fulfilling, but it is not without much attack, much, all, every, any emotion you can imagine. It comes, but thank God for the power of his word. That's what keeps me going. I know what his word said. That's what happens when you're at home at your office, the phone rings. <laughs> But uh, I know what God's word said. That's the only reason I'm not consumed. That's the reason I'm not destroyed. That's the reason I have not given up. That's the reason I'm not crazy. That's the reason I'm not depressed. Because I remind myself of the word. By his stripes, I'm healed. Mentally, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, financially, materially, in every way. Physically, by his stripes, I'm healed. John said, beloved... I would that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Those are the scriptures that I keep in my spirit that keep me going and keep the enemy from consuming me. The Lord bless you real good. Don't forget also to be a blessing to the work of the Lord. You can even bless the work tonight. You don't have to wait until Sunday. You can bless the work tonight. Uh, we need your help. We need your support. We need you to pray that those millions that we need, that God would just do a quick work. Come on, saints, let's get into let's get into this. Let's do it. Let's get excited about our church. Excitement is contagious. When you come to church, you ought to be shouting and dancing and screaming and hollering, all with dignity, you know, and not out of order. But man, make it known. I love my church. Talk up your church like you talk up Jesus and get people to this great Christ. God bless you. I pray that you have a great, great remainder of the week. And that God will shine on you and smile mightily upon you. May his favor be with you in all that you say and all that you do. God, I pray now for the people of the Lord, as we leave from this time of instruction, I pray that people are inclined to really talk about Jesus. Give them the, the, the anointing to do so and let people ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on your people. As we leave now, Lord, but never your presence. I speak prosperity and favor over your people. I pray that you touch every condition under the sound of my voice. Whatever people are going through, I want you to give them the victory and the, that they need, the healing they need or whatever it is. I call it done in the mighty name of Jesus. And unto him who was able to keep you from falling and who's able to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and forever. And everybody shout it out. Amen. God bless you. I love you all with the love of the Lord. Please keep praying for us. We just want to do the will of the Lord and serve you with as, as much proficiency as possible. I look to see your son. They got a good word on Father's Day, and I want you to invite some men to come to church. God bless you. We'll see you soon.